So hello, everybody. Thank you again for coming to the kickoff of our trustee training series. This is, as I mentioned, the first of an eight part series put on by the North Dakota State Library. Um, each session is actually going to be pretty short, uh, 15 to 30 minutes to try to respect your time, but also so that these can hopefully be used in board meetings later for training. Um, I know most of you here are from North Dakota. Um, so just know that this is heavily targeted towards North Dakota libraries, looking at our laws and statutes. Um, if you have, um, if you're from another library or end up working in another library in another state, uh, you are going to have to reach out to your own state library for their best practices. Um, all right, so as I mentioned, I sent you that link to the board libguide. If you would like to find that link again by yourself, you can either um, download the slides and you'll have uh, this libguide link right up here at the top or else you can go to our website uh, library.nd.gov click on services for libraries and education um, underneath the big cloud there's a link to libguides and you'll scroll down to public library board of trustees uh, the agenda for today uh, we're going to be looking at what it means to be a governing board in north dakota Spoiler alert, all public library boards in the state are governing boards. Uh, none of you are advisory boards. Um, we're going to be talking about the duties of board members, uh, orientation of new trustees, and then your role in advocating for the library on behalf of your community. Um, so first, who am I and what makes me qualified? Uh, to instruct you, I am Abby Ebach. I've been a public library specialist at the State Library for three years. I care so deeply about the importance of a well-functioning library board, and I truly, truly believe that you are doing a public service by giving your time and your talent to your local library. Um, but an also very important note is that I'm not a lawyer, and so anything I say cannot be considered legal advice. Please consult your local attorney with questions. All right, so starting off, I want to talk about the library board as a whole. So we'll talk um, more about board structure in a different session, but I'm going to start in North Dakota Century Code, section 403803, number one. And so that reads, the governing body of a municipality that has established a public library and reading room, or the board of county commissioners for a county library, shall appoint a board of five directors who must be residents of the municipality or county, as the case may be, to govern the library and reading room. It goes on, uh, but I want to kind of reflect on that section that I put up on the slide. The governing body appoints you, the library board, the library trustee, to govern the library and the reading room, which is a lot of power. Uh, the governing board has a legal responsibility to the library and to the community. Trustees are appointed from within the taxing jurisdiction of their library by either city council or county commission. Um, this shows the legal body of the community has entrusted the governance of the library to the board and each individual trustee. Um, governing boards are responsible for maintaining the library's fiscal integrity, uh, managing policies and long range plans are kind of the big ones. They're all really high level things that help the library run smoothly for the betterment of your entire community that you're serving. Um, the board's also charged with making sure the library is achieving its mission and vision, which they conveniently help write. Um, advocacy is another important part of being a library trustee. Um, this obviously means going to community groups, talking about the library services, and then going to city and county meetings to advocate for more funding, among other things. I have a whole session on advocacy uh, here in a few weeks. <laughs> um, so one of the really, really key important things to understand is that a governing board is different from an advisory board. And this is one of the most common sources of confusion and angst I see in library boards around the state. So advisory boards are really common in nonprofits. Um, they exist in other contexts, but um, they usually have representatives from like stakeholders in their areas of expertise. 
So an example would be the North Dakota Library Coordinating Council. They are the advisory board for the North Dakota State Library. And it's made up of representatives from a bunch of different types of libraries. So public and private academics, schools, public, special libraries, and then their citizens at large. These are all stakeholders in what the State Library is doing. Uh, they're expected to give recommendations and then they advise the State Library based on their personal expertise. On the other hand, we have you, a governing board that has a legal responsibility to the library. You don't just make recommendations, you make decisions, um, especially in regards to finances and running the library. Um, library board members need to be representative of the entire community and not just the stakeholders in the library. Uh, that can be a semi-controversial opinion. Um, so, you are not an advisory board, you are a member of a governing board, um, you need to practice your duties as laid out in Sentry Code, which I'm about to go over. I promise for breaking all presentation rules and doing this in a semi-text heavy fashion, there's not an easier way to do it. Um, all right. So according to Century Code, uh, Library Board of Trustees has six specific duties. So number one is to make and adopt such bylaws, rules, and regulations relating to the duties of the officers of the board as may be expedient and not inconsistent with the provisions of this chapter. Uh, so kind of boiling that down is that the Library Board writes its own bylaws to govern itself. Uh, number two, to make and adopt such bylaws, rules, and regulations for the management of the library and reading room as are expedient and not inconsist inconsistent with the provisions of this chapter. A little more exciting, it has a companion statute in 403807, uh, but it gives the library board to craft and enforce policies for the library. I love policies. I think it's an exciting statute. Uh, number three, personal favorite, it's highlighted in my copy of library law, uh, to control exclusively the expenditures of all monies collected for or contributed to the library fund. Uh, so yes, the library board controls all of the library's money in the library fund, not the city or county. Um, this piece of statute is really, really helpful when you're talking about finances with like a local auditor, with the city council, county commission, the budgeting process can be complicated and all cities and counties handle their money differently. Um, and we'll kind of talk about that in a different session again. But in general, the library board chooses how the library fund will be spent and then empowers the library director and staff to use those funds for the betterment of the library and therefore the community. Okay, number four is to have the supervision, care, and custody of the library property and of the rooms or buildings constructed, leased, or set apart for the use of library purposes. So the library board owns the library property, right, is kind of what this one boils down to, but it's the property of the library, not the governing body. So this piece of statute can be really important when you're talking about like weeding materials from the library. Um, so boards typically decide through policy what they're going to do with these discarded materials. Uh, when it comes to larger items like furniture, <laughs> there can be local like ordinances and guidelines that need to be followed, especially if furniture falls over like a certain monetary threshold. I don't pretend to understand um, city ordinances as well, <laughs> but um, you do sometimes need to check with your city on that one. Uh, the statute is also very popularly referenced when the library board needs to emphasize that their meeting rooms can be used for library programs and have library specific policies within the, of that meeting room. Um, even if that meeting room is used by um, other government boards or committees. If it is library property, it can fall under library policy. Um, Again, this one can be kind of confusing because like a lot of our libraries rent space from like city hall. Mm -hmm. um, and so 
we need to be clear that the library board's responsibility is of the library space, not like you're not making policies for City Hall. Um, only the portion of City Hall that the library is in. Does that make sense? If not, throw a question in the chat. I can ramble on about it a bit more. Um, the fifth duty in Century Code is um, to contract to furnish library service and to receive library service from other counties, school districts, and cities of the state of North Dakota and adjoining states and the state library. It's a lot of words, um, but essentially the Library of Trustees as a governing board can enter into a contract on behalf of the library to receive library service or provide library service. And then number six, um, the last explicit duty in Century Code is to employ qualified personnel to administer the public library and dispense library services. So the library board as a whole, not an individual trustee, but the board as a whole reports or is the boss of the library director. The library director reports directly to the board. So like I said, those are the explicit duties as laid out in Century Code that you have a responsibility to <coughs> uphold. Um, so in general, as you can kind of tell, the library board is in charge of most of the big picture items of the library. So using the library's funding responsibly, following the law, um, devising and then following the strategic plan, advocacy, um, crafting policy and procedure alongside the director, and then conducting evaluations of the library director. Um, one of my most common questions I get is kind of where this, like how different issues fall along this line of, is it the board's responsibility or is it the director's? Um, larger libraries might also say, okay, well, how does my friends or foundation group um, fit into that? And luckily for you, the Connecticut State Library and other Connecticut library groups made this super beautiful chart that addresses all of those items. Um, I know that it's probably some small text on your screens, so I will read out some of the more important ones. Um, it's also linked in that LibGuide. So while the library board is in charge of employing the library director and evaluating them, the library director is in charge of the rest of the staff. Um, additionally, the library director is in charge of collection development and programs, but the board approves the budget for those items during the budget budgeting process. The friend's role in this example would be to support the library services by fundraising, volunteering, and advocacy efforts. Um, when it comes to the larger budget process, like I just mentioned, the library director is going to prepare the library budget generally in according with the governing body. And then the local board or the library board is going to approve it or modify it um, before they approve it. And then it will go to the governing body for final approval. Um, again, all cities and counties will handle this process a little differently, but in general, that's like your guiding timeline. Um, at board meetings, the library board is expected to attend um, and participate. The library director acts uh, mostly in an informational capacity, but, and I absolutely cannot emphasize this enough, the library director is not a member of the library board. They are not one of those five members that Century Code lays out, ever. In no situation is the library director part of the library board. Um, do we have any questions before we kind of jump topics? Uh, feel free to speak out or throw them into chat. So oh, I have I have a question for you. When you know the city statute or ordinance, do they take precedence over the library board's decisions? Uh, it depends in what context. Um, so the library board should be following the law, which includes your local ordinances. And so being a home rule city would make a difference for us. Yes, being home rule makes a lot of difference. And for those of you that don't know, home rule tends to be that like that city or county has 
approved a home rule charter where they essentially kind of write their own taxing laws. That's a very, very boiled down um, description. So how, how, how does home rule affect us then? Um, so I know some home rule libraries um, might, within their cities, they might get more than the statute allotted mills. So Century Code lays out four mills as a cap for library service. Some home rule cities or counties have chosen to go above that. Um, I believe some of them have changed the number of board members on the library board, um, but really that needs to be taken up locally. But it mostly will impact your funding. Um, I see a question here on the oversight of the director by the city or county administration. Um, that can be complicated um, because of local politics. In a perfect world, again, the library board is in charge of the library director. Um, the city council or county commission has appointed those board members to be the governing body of the library. Um, so in theory, the city and county administration shouldn't have any, I don't want to say any say in what the library is doing, um, but not as not as much oversight. They should be informed because that's um, for the betterment of the library and the community, but um, they shouldn't be making sweeping decisions because that's only in the power of the library board. Does that help? What was the question? Um, just talking about the oversight of the library director by city or county administration. Okay. Um, that can get into local politics, but you can always fall back on that state statute where the city and county are appointing library board members to be, to govern the library. Abby, yep. did that question come up in, in your chat? It came up as a direct message. Oh, okay. Yes, you didn't miss it, Carmen. Okay. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> Okay. Um, yes, feel free to um, throw more questions into chat. If not, I'm going to move on here to working with new board members. So um, kind of talking about responsibilities and then what makes a library board member successful. First of all, anybody in your community can be a board member. It doesn't matter if they are wealthy, you do not have to be a college graduate. You don't need to be a lawyer or an accountant. I think that's really important for me to tell you, but then for you to also tell your community, right? I think being a board member can sometimes sound like really high level and complicated or like I'm not qualified. Um, and I think that people really need to hear that you can be a board member. We promise it's not scary. Um, here's how to here's kind of how to make being a board member more accessible. Um, that's not to say that like having an accountant on your board isn't really helpful. Um, they understand how budgets work, which is really handy. Um, but you wouldn't want them like leading the board budget discussion because um, that needs to be an equal opportunity access point for the entire board. Um, the only thing that's really, really important is to avoid a conflict of interest. Um, so you wouldn't want this mythical board accountant, um, or that is an accountant on the library board, you wouldn't want them to be like your treasurer. Um, that could result in a conflict of interest. Um, the things that are important um, is listed in the State Library's Trustee Manual are a willingness and ability to donate uh, your time and to work with others. Um, board member terms are three years. So um, a new trustee needs to be committing to three years worth of board meetings, budget meetings, external reading, volunteer hours. Um, you're, most of you are on your library board, so you know the extra time that is going into this. Um, outside of just like a monthly or bi-monthly meeting. 
Um, it's really important for trustees to understand how the library operates in relation to the rest of the city or county. Um, so kind of like I just explained with oversight, but then just understanding like where the money comes from and how it's budgeted for library services. Um, this can be taught to them during orientation, but that willingness to learn it needs to be there already. Um, and having like a foundational knowledge about a city or county's operating structure is so, so helpful. I had to learn all of that when I came on this job and it was, it was eye-opening for me, that's for sure. Um, some other helpful characteristics of a trustee um, is that they're willing to advocate for the library by talking to the community. Um, so um, participating in other community groups, um, again, willingness to work with others for the betterment of the library. So going out and working with other people in your cities, in your towns. Um, some people really strongly believe that library board members need to be like avid readers and frequent library patrons. Um, I tend to disagree for the following reasons. Um, the first is that libraries have more than physical books available to their patrons. So all residents of North Dakota have access to databases and eBooks and audiobooks. Um, outreach events, bookmobiles and book bikes, those are all access points for library or for just people, not even patrons. Um, and then, well, like most of those things are going to require a library card. They don't require somebody to be physically present in the main branch of your library. Um, a person can be a really, really avid consumer of library resources without you ever seeing their face. Um, and then, of course, there's the services that your library offers to people without library cards. So story times, book clubs, um, computer privileges, newspaper reading, maker spaces. Having a library card does not mean that a person doesn't value your library. Um, on the other hand, as much as we prefer not to think of it, some people just aren't going to use your library. Um, they might not, they might fear fines on their cards. They don't have the money. They might be working during the hours the library is open. Um, they might be like me and like to write in their books so they know that they shouldn't be checking out library books. Um, these people can still be really, really valuable to the library. They can value the library and support its development, its mission, its vision. And I personally think that having people like this on your board really broadens the perspective of the board as a whole and can assist with reaching other potential library users. They're going to have new and fresh ideas. Again, that's my controversial opinion. So my caveat here is that once they are a board member, they should sign up for a library card um, and familiarize, familiarize themselves with all the resources and all formats so that they can speak about them with personal experience. Um, Okay, when new trustees join the board, uh, it's important for the library director with the assistance of the library board president to conduct a new trustee orientation. Um, so this is not only a learning opportunity for the new board member, but it's also a requirement of the North Dakota Library Coordinating Council standards for public libraries at the developing level. So in order for your library to remain eligible for library vision grants, you do need to be doing this. Uh, an outline for trustee training can be found on the LibGuide that I linked you, um, but a general overview um, I can do right now. Okay, so once a new trustee has been appointed by the city or county, the library director should reach out to them, welcome them, provide them some background information on the library and board. Um, this might include the names of other board members, their terms of office, the basic calendar of meetings and deadlines, Board's bylaws, basic information. So libraries, mission and vision, hours, services, programs. Um, these items should be given to the new trustee before their orientation. So they have context for what they're walking into. Um, again, customize this to fit your individual library. But those are generally the things that I list off um, to give before the orientation. And then at the actual orientation, is where you're going to get into the nitty gritty of your specific library. So 
uh, maybe a tour of the library and staff areas. Uh, you're going to answer all the questions, um, talk about the role of the library board like I just did. Uh, you can present them this webinar. Hello, new board members. Um, it's really important for the new trustee to have an idea of how board meetings are runs and what to expect so that when they do begin um, attending these board meetings as a trustee, they, they know what's happening. They don't feel so lost. Um, you can encourage them to attend board meetings before they're formally appointed. Um, but I also think it's important to give board members like the last six months worth of minutes for board meetings and the director's reports just f again for context so they're not coming in and playing complete catch up um, other stuff that can be shared at orientation would be the budget strategic plans policies annual reports um, the library coordinating council standards for public libraries document and then if you have a large staff an organizational chart um, all of this can be like, that sounds like a lot of paper. That's, that's a lot of documents. Um, I know some libraries in the state will actually have like a pre-made binder with all of this information so that they can just reference it and be like, here is our manual for new directors. Here you go. Um, and that's really helpful. Um, you can also do it online if you don't want to do it all on paper. Um, and then one of the most important parts of orientation is learning about the powers of the board. Um, and then other laws that surround it. So an overview of 4038, um, which is the century code that goes over public libraries specifically, 4404 covers open record and meeting laws. And then you can provide them with the entire library trustee manual. It's about 80 pages. So again, this is where you could do it online if you don't want to print it all out. Um, but that goes over the duties of the board and the director. Um, and then kind of last but not least at this orientation is um, discussing how board meetings are run, the expectations of them as a board member and their importance to the library. Let them know that you value them, that they are doing a community service. And then also like the logistics, if somebody is entering a board and they've never been on a board before, parliamentary procedure is probably very confusing to them. Um, I'm still kind of trying to, trying to get, have a grasp of it. Um, so you can go over parliamentary procedure. You can talk about different advocacy opportunities that they have as a board member, how the library is funded, um, different partnerships that are going on, accomplishments, challenges, all of these good things. Again, that is a whole lot of information for orientation of a new board member. I think it's all really important, um, but like, you need to customize this for your library, for your board, and for what's going to work best so that when somebody joins your board, they have the background information they need, they're up to speed, and they're not getting lost um, on day one. Um, okay, once they've been onboarded, uh, we want to welcome them to the team. Teamwork amongst board members is of the utmost importance. It provides for productive discourse and then a solid foundation for library growth. This is really important when there's a disagreement amongst the boards. I'm not naive. I know sometimes boards don't agree on everything. Um, but I think it's really important to emphasize that while the library board as a whole has legal authority, you as an individual board Hello. member don't have any. No single board member has legal authority. Board members need to support the consensus and decision of the board once a motion has passed, um, hopefully respectfully. Um, so for example, let's say uh, one of the gentlemen in this picture feels very strongly that the library should continue to impose fines on items that are returned late, but the rest of the board votes to remove library fines altogether. Um, the person that disagrees is still going to have to support that decision going forward, especially publicly, to show that united front of the board. He can personally disagree with it, but that's the decision of the board and it is the decision going forward. Holding petty grievances and grudges is not going to be helpful in this case. Um, other ways the board really needs to work as a team is working on committees for special projects, uh, crafting goals for the strategic plan, brainstorming fundraising ideas, and just generally working collaboratively to help the library succeed. And this 
touches on our very final topic of the day. I'm sorry, I'm going kind of long here. Whoops. Um, but advocacy. So, like I said, I have a whole session on advocacy um, here in a few weeks. But it's honestly one of the most important things that you do as a board member. Um, it's one of the most important things that people who love libraries can do. Um, board members need to be shouting from the rooftops the accomplishments of their library because like they know exactly what's going on. If those that dedicate their time to govern the library, right, they're putting 12, 15, 30 hours a year into this, if they're not going to celebrate all of the library's wins, why would anybody else? Um, so the board should regularly report to the governing bodies um, and the general public about the library's goings on. So their annual statistics like circulation and programming numbers, um, but then promoting the library's programs and services. Um, board members um, might consider writing like a little elevator speech or talking points if elevator speech sounds really scary for you. Um, <laughs> um, but you can talk about this um, together, get your talking points together about your library and what makes it important. Um, I can give you a few of my favorite statistics. Um, if you just want to like sneak those into the back of your brain for the next time you're talking about how awesome libraries are. Um, in 2018, North Dakota had the second highest number of outreach vehicles per capita in the United States. We have one outreach vehicle for every 63,000 people. 77% uh, of libraries in North Dakota serve communities of less than 5,000 people. All but seven of our libraries are considered small and rural by the IMLS definition. The average library in North Dakota receives $26.09 in funding per capita, but over half of our libraries receive less than $13.25 per capita. Um, in 2018, North Dakotans visited the library over 2 million times. They had an attendance of almost 250,000 at their programs. Um, so those are just kind of my, some of my favorite statistics. Um, but you as a board member, you need to be looking at your local library, at the library you serve, then also some of these state and national level library statistics and find the ones that are meaningful for you that, and that you care about and craft those and use those um, to share your personal story and your personal advocacy efforts. Uh, you can reflect on like the library services and what the library means to you um, and then how that can impact other people in the community. Um, so short and sweet there on advocacy. Again, I'm sorry I ran a little long. I know people have to leave here, but does anybody have any questions about stuff I covered today? The general makeup of the board, division of directors and boards, <coughs> trustees, anything like that? All right, um, feel free to throw them into chat if you do. If not, here's our contact information. I'm Abby Ebach, the Public Library Specialist. Um, and then I also have Carmen Redding, the Library Services Division Director, and then the State Librarian Mary Susie's contact information. You can contact any of us at any time with your questions. Um, we're always happy to talk with you um, about your position on the board or the library in general. And then our next session is on Thursday. So hopefully I will see you all then. Um, if not, have a great day.